Hello, everybody. How are you today? Welcome back to another episode. My guest today, the very wonderful Caroline Smith. How are you? I am just great. How are you, David? I'm having a day. I'm, I'm wearing this hat because my hair is not done and ready for uh, <laughs> to be to be seen by people. I kind of I kind of had a panic attack last night. Have you had those yet in 2020? Uh, well, I'm an, I'm an early adopter. I've been having them since like 1995. So. Oh man. I, I, how do yours manifest? Cause I can tell you how mine, mine started like three 30 in the morning. I just like was awake and my heart was racing. And then I'm like, I'm going to be broke. Oh no. Too, I don't have enough money. Ah, ah, this, every, the world is falling apart. I'm going to be, ah, ah, and just freaked out for like two hours. And I couldn't get back to sleep till like five 30. Yeah, those are exactly the type that I have where I kind of go like in a spiral where I think of like the worst case scenario every single time. And then after living through like some other recessions, it's like I got through them. <laughs> that is very funny about everyone living in the last, like if you if you worked in the last 20 years, you could say, oh, this is, what is this, my third, fourth recession? What is this, my, the Great Depression rep recession, the Great now, what are they calling this one? They call it, um, besides the pandemic, they, they're, they're calling it strange times or they're calling it, and these uncertain times, you always hear that. In, yes, oh, unprecedented, that's un the word. Every yeah. single event every month is unprecedented. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> but they're always trying to sell you a brand new car at like so much money. And they're like, we know you don't have a job, but today the new 2020 so-and-so, so-and-sos are only available for Fifty thousand dollars. So get a get a new so and so, and don't think about get on the open road. We know we know that some things are closed, but you know what's not closed? The open road or whatever it is. And it's like, no, I'm so scared. I need to get my teeth cleaned, <laughs> like those kind of things. I'd love to get my, can I tell you a pandemic uh, pandemic dream story? Please do. This sounds like a fable, but um, so I don't know if you heard. I know you used to live in Oregon. I don't know if mm -hmm. you heard about how bad the unemployment situation was here with people waiting like six months on average to get there. No, I want to hear. I, I saw some. I saw one of our mutual friends. Um, he's an illustrator, and or no, no, it was a uh, Kevin Michael Moore. I didn't want to say. Maybe, maybe I'll. Uh, he he was saying that he got all his checks at one one time. He was yeah, very it, so. Yeah. It's crazy. So tell me a little bit more about that. So I thought, yeah, it took me like six months to get them. Um, because that was, it was for um, pandemic uh, unemployment assistant, which is what like artists and people who are self-employed, which I'm self-employed and I am lucky that I had everything registered for um, the open mic that I ran and for my photography business because I probably could not have gotten it otherwise. But um, so I filed for all that. I had all my tax information from last year. Like, thank God I just had it all ready to go. It, it took me because the Oregon system wasn't set up for that. Like, did you hear the story behind that? That they got money 10 years ago to fix all of their computers for unemployment here. Um, no, I didn't hear any of that. I was using like um, code from like the, the 90s where sometimes like people who like wrote that code are probably like retired now. And most people aren't like learning that. I don't know the like the exact like um, technicalities behind it, but basically they they were paid all this money that's just been sitting in account to update the computers ten years ago, and they never did, As, you know, because they weren't planning on like this catastrophic, this unprecedented event <laughs> happening where like millions of people filed for unemployment all at once, and plus it's the first time that self-employed people could get unemployment. That's. I I'm so happy that you had all that stuff. Like, this is the first time I think cause I've been talking to all comedians, but it, you bring up a very good point about being self-employed. How long have you been self-employed right now? Like, like with everything signed up, like b besides gig economy, like not like you, cause you were, you've done photography and you've done other things. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, um, so I work for a company just two months since we are doing graduation photography. I'm a, like, um, it's called a team captain, which is basically like sort of like a manager, but there's a lot of different team captains and we lead teams to uh, take pictures at graduations all over the country. And like I work in the on the West Coast, but they'll fly me to like LA or Seattle or wherever just to, to shoot a graduation with a team of other photographers. But and that was like really good money, but it's only two months out of the year, but you work like sometimes you work three, four graduations a day, like 12 to 14 hours a day. So that was the only W2 job that I had. But then I was doing headshots, mostly for comedians besides that. And like, I was just doing it in my house, but it was like, I was having to move furniture like every day. So then I got a studio so I could just take pictures of people there. And it was going really, really well uh, until this whole thing 
happen. So, um, and yeah, all the, all, the, all the people who are artists, like, you know, we lost our income because we couldn't perform, like musicians couldn't perform. And those were all the people I was taking headshots. Yeah. I mean, it, it is really, it really, and Carol, if you don't know, uh, Caroline is a really good photographer. Uh, where can people find your photography? Do you have like an Instagram for your photography? Yeah, so, um, I'm pivoting to more fashion photography, but I want to do like regular people like um, doing fashion stuff. Um, I or just wearing like their favorite clothes. So if you look on, it's starry-eyed Carolina. I'm not gonna, I guess they can't really see me. And we'll we'll put in links and everything like that. But like, yeah, I I've been really inspired because I've always loved photography and I've always looked when I saw your uh, you've been you've been taking headshots of comedians and really 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 great headshots. I've seen like your work all over the place, but uh, it's always an inspiration to see. And that must stink because I don't know for if it's the same as comedy like. I remember before the pandemic, I was feeling a little like, oh, I do I want to go to a mic? Do I want to go to a show? Do I want to, yeah. do I want to? And then I was, and then, I'll, yeah. And then all of a sudden it got taken away from me. And I'll, now I'm like, oh, I miss it so much. But there's that, there's that kind of thing when you create art and you, I'm not sure it's there for photography. You kind of have to be in the right mindset. And now when you're in a panic to mindset, it's kind of, it kind of exhausts you even to think about making art or anything like that. Yeah, to do anything like I'm like proud of myself or like I exercise like a few times a week. I shower every day. That's like my baseline, my minimum thing I have to do is shower. That's real. That's and I know that sounds like a like a min like a very like oh yeah, but you really do have to kind of keep on living because you kind of feel like I've I've never been I've never experienced anything like jail or prison, but this solitary confinement has been exhausting it is to exhausting. live through. Yeah, it's like you. I'm trying to get you know you try to have your little routines. And stuff and like I mean I cooked like pretty often before this but now it's like I just cook these elaborate meals and, and plan these elaborate meals just like the only little like serotonin boost I get sometimes during the day and it's like you know you can only watch so many hours of TV exactly I, th I think that's an interesting way to think because I've always the, the way the podcast started off is just about jobs but you know what jobs can also be a way to make the day go through and whether you have a good job or a bad job I'm thinking we cut you cut off but like how do you feel like about the mentality of what a job means to you what does it mean in the broader scope of it well it gives you purpose it makes you it gives you a reason like for some so many people um their entire identity is their job or like the title that they have and I think I've really seen a lot of people in the last year who are comedians it's like they think like their number one identity is being a comedian and then like, if you're not doing comedy, what are you then? It's, it's a hard, it's a hard thing. And it's not just, it's not just the telling, you know, jokes. It's like, it's not just being funny in front of strength. It also like, you kind of, I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's, it is very strange. You kind of, I did the podcast because I, I wanted to have an outlet to let people know that I'm one, I'm okay. And two, I can feel creative. And three, it's a new, good way to connect with you. Like I was looking forward to it all day that I get to speak to another human being. And I'm like, I just need it. I don't know about you. Like it, Zoom is nice, but it's, it's going to be nice to actually be around human beings again one day. Yeah. I mean, I have my roommate and then I'm so lucky that I, I met somebody and I got a boyfriend about six weeks before this all happened. And so like, I mean, we socially distanced for six weeks where we only like uh, talked over uh, FaceTime or like we met up for a hike a couple of times, but like stayed six feet from each other. And it was just sur surreal. It was like Victorian times again, or just, you know, or like we were Mormon. It was really. <laughs> You're gonna start writing love letters to each other again. Like everyone's gonna get in calligraphy in 2020 or something like that. I don't know what's, what's gonna happen. Like who talks on the phone to their boyfriend that lives in the same town as them? He lives across. He lives nine minutes away from me. Right? I, li I like that idea. You should get one of those like those retro phones, like that plug in the wall and like that that's clear and you can see all the little bits of the phone and or just rotary. yeah. But uh, it, it is it is so as someone that's self employed, you must have you you probably didn't start off self employed. Can you think about the first job that you had? Oh yeah. So I mean the very first job that I had was babysitting but the first job where it wasn't just like an informal exchange of money is I actually worked for the Red Cross um, sorry that was actually Luke my boyfriend texts me right now um, <laughs> hi Luke <laughs> uh, I worked for the Red Cross because um, um, my mother used to volunteer for them at blood drives and stuff like that 
and it's really interesting. So I worked there for an entire summer under a grant during the AIDS crisis in the 1990s. So I worked for them in 1996 as something called a teen peer counselor. And their whole idea is they, uh, they gave out grants to areas in the 90s that were really hard hit um, by the AIDS crisis. So there was a lot of people that were HIV positive. And then in our community, in our town, there's a lot of people that were HIV positive. And they thought that if they, I mean, it's kind of a brilliant idea, but it's, it's kind of crazy at the same time. They were like, you know, who's going to listen to teenagers about sex is other teenagers. So I had to teach sex education to other teenagers and I was a virgin and we would go to like juvenile, like detention. And like, I would have to like put like condoms in a banana and be like this and this about sex, but I had never even kissed anybody. But I got paid fifteen dollars an hour, which is better than I can say for most jobs in Portland. Uh, that is amazing. I like the idea of the of the blind teaching the blind on that one. Oh yes. Uh, I mean, I'm, I can remember being at juvie and like teaching like how to put a condom on, and some guy raising his hand, and he totally had like the ankle like things on and stuff, and like the van shoes and the, and the orange jumpsuit. And I was like, yes, yeah, you. And he was like, what's your favorite position, girl? And like, I didn't even know. Literally didn't know what he was talking about because like I said, I've never even kissed anybody, so. You're like, bed? I don't know. Like, you don't really know. I had no idea. Um, uh, I remember when, when it was, was speaking of sex ed that I walked in, I was from the generation where you would watch videos and there was like a male one and a, and a female one. And I showed up on the wrong day. I think I was like late a day or I would miss a day. And I walked into the classroom and it was just my home room. And I got sat down, I got handed a tampon and said, watch this video. God. And I'm like, I'm learning about the female reproductive system. And I'm like, what is, and they're like, your body's changing. You may not know the ways, but it will be forever changed. And I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> like, so, and then I had to talk to the vice principal to like understand, oh no, that wasn't for you. You're learning about the other side of things and sorry about that. And then I'm like, okay. And then I had to go home and tell my mom, like, I learned some stuff about the female body. And she's like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I feel like they should teach guys about that though, like, and, and separately too. I understand why they separate the mm -hmm. kids. They don't want like, you know, boys teasing the girls and like vice versa or whatever. And I'm sure in like the male one, you guys probably talk about like wet dreams and boners or like. So whatever. much talk about wet dreams. I, it's like, it's, it's like a lot. You're like, what is this Nickelodeon? There's, I've never heard this much talk about wet and slime and all that stuff. I'm like, this is nuts. <laughs> It just, I don't know. I feel like why it would benefit people to learn like across about like. How, I mean, how, how long was your presentation when you taught sex ed? How long did you make, did you? So I went in with like a group of people and there was like a facilitator that was older. That was probably, I mean, you know, when you're 15, it's not kind of hard to tell like how much older someone is. Like to me, he's probably in his thirties or forties, but honestly he could have been in his mid twenties. I don't. Yeah. Someone that's 25 can be any age. Yeah. Seriously. Um, so there'd be like 10 of us that would go in and we would take turns doing it. And I remember we did, um, I will say like, it probably had a, more of an effect on me than anyone else. Cause like, I still always practice safe sex. And like, I mean, I don't know if you remember the, I don't know if we can talk about this, but I don't know if you remember the great like chlamydia scare of uh, Portland comedy like uh, several years ago. I think we could talk about it. It's an explicit podcast. So, I mean, as long as we don't name names, I think that's, I mean, yeah names or anything um so there i think and I, I i'm not one of the people that got it but so there's like 16 or 17 people that all caught chlamydia from within the portland um comedy community and i was like well how did this happen and as i talked to people i realized there's a lot of people in our community that don't use condoms and i realized because you know i don't know if you know this but i turned 40 this year i'm a lot older and, you know, a lot of these guys that are doing comedy who are like 23, 24. And I was like, oh, my God, they were born after the AIDS crisis. Like, it hasn't been, like, drilled into their brain that they have to wear a condom. And it's like, and I'm not trying to, like, shame anybody or anything. But I'm like, I'm like, you guys, like, I cannot believe you guys aren't wearing condoms. So that's how that happened. But because I grew up in the AIDS crisis and I helped that teen peer council thing, I also saw, besides AIDS, I saw so many pictures of like penises and vaginas that had STDs and like, we had a folder and we would pass them around. Yeah. To look at. I, I mean, before Google, I think that I did the same thing where you'd go through a book at the nurse's office and like, you'd find like, you'd like, oh, I don't feel good. And then she just have a book 
yeah. of venereal diseases. Do you remember the, like, does that sound familiar to you? And then you're like, what is this book? No, but there was definitely like one of the counselors at my high school just always had like a prominent copy of copy of our bodies ourselves. Like, yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen that book. It was written in like the 70s. It's some like sexual revolution. No, I, I don't. I, I'm trying to think of like, yeah, that, that the, the sex talk thing. My dad did it when I was too old. I got the sex talk <laughs> twice, like once at like 16. Once my mom walked on, in on me, like, like kind of like doing stuff. And I'm like, and I'm like, what do you do? I'm like putting things, you know, when you like get done with things and you're like putting things away when you're a teenager <laughs> and you're like, and, and as a boy, there's, there's like some like, oh, some scaffolding has to come down or whatever, whatever it is. And so like, it was one of those things where I'm like, ah, <laughs> I'm just, and I'm like doing like a, I'm doing like a Ace Ventura kind of my leg is up and I'm like doing karate moves to my mom. I'm like, what do you want? And she's like, I'm just checking on you. I just, there was, it was too. You just plunge into like your teenage son's room. It's like. I don't know. Yeah. So like, I'm all kinds of all, I didn't, uh, unfortunately, I, I think I, I made it through. I've had STDs tests and never had, knock on wood, never had any STDs or I, I'm, I mean, I, the only thing I'm always scared of is just like, I don't know how like HPV floats in and I don't know about that. And like, HPV is the only one that I've had. And if you have any questions, I can answer them pretty well for you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Maybe we'll put a little link. We'll put it like, if you make, want to make a YouTube video, we're like, how to know if you have HPV, <laughs> that would be helpful. But I, I, carriers. yeah. And, and it's just, it's just a scary time. I'm so glad that you got to do that before you had, because that does, that is a very informative time to, to know about that. And like, it seems like everything I know about you, I, I can tell you one job I know about you, but it seems like everything you do, everything I've known about you since I've known you, every job you've had is about some kind of caring for other people. Like the one job I can remember you doing when I, when I, when I walked in, because I worked right next to you for a while. Oh, I yeah. worked at a little warehouse, but you would, I would see you and you would serve tea. And mm -hmm. that's, tea is a very calming and, and people, as I, get, as I get into this eight months in this pandemic, I am enjoying, I eat my dinner very early, like an old man. And then I have a cup of tea and then I relax and then I go to sleep. And that's been my kind of like soothing, calming, instead of like, cause for the first six months it was like, drink until I'm passing out. Like, <laughs> and then now I'm like tea and yoga and I'm gonna stretch and my back doesn't feel as bad in the morning and that kind of thing. So you've always been a kind of person that like said, so it makes sense why your first job would be with the Red Cross and $15 an hour, isn't that, what was the, was that the time of your life at 15 where you would consider all that money to be disposable income? Oh my God, yes. Are you kidding me? Like yeah. every day. So it'd be like once or twice a week, but still it's like $30 for two hours of your time when the minimum wage then was like, I think 475 or something. Like I felt rich, like all that money went to Delia's pretty much like the clothing. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna ask, what, 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 did, your, what, is, what did your money go to? Uh, like baby like midriff crop shirts and like glitter sandals and uh like flannel and yeah yeah it's a big deal the first time you have like disposable income like now all my income is categorized and boxed off and this goes here and this is savings and this is this is credit card bills and this is rent and <laughs> what, what what was that I said savings <laughs> it's it's a minuscule it's like a if i break my leg I want to be able to pay for it. Not like, I don't want to be going to debt for breaking my leg kind of thing. Knock on wood. Oh my God. Uh, no, at 15, I definitely was like, oh, you know, my parents like insurance will take care of that. I mean, I've, I've broken a finger and I've broken a toe, so. Uh, which one's worse? Um, you know, the toe one was bad because my toenail turned black and it took like a year for it to grow out. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that one was worse. And wow really do anything you can't really do like a splint like you can tape it to the other toe whereas i got like a cute little like splint for my finger people always have the like right now let's see it's like you can kind of see i have a cut i have oh, a yeah. card yeah. i have a cardboard cut because i got a brand new couch and i assembled it all together and uh it's, it's nice to have a, a couch but i remember i remember i dropped a i was making shelving at that warehouse i was working at and I dropped a shelf on my, it was like a 30 pound shelf on my toe and the toenail fell off and I'm like, ouch. And yeah. I remember you would, I would limp a lot more after that. And it took about four to five months, I think for the toenail to grow back, but it grew back like, 
bumpy like that couple is that, is that joy division the that co that cover where it's just the whip the the waves yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what my toe looked like for a while there um did you ever have to work with an injury like that with a broken toe or or a finger like that um i uh i definitely have like injured my foot before also um because i i dance like i dance regularly oh, it's another job um i'm certified as a dance teacher i actually haven't like taught any classes mostly because all the gyms have shut down and i just got my certification like a year ago but yeah i've definitely like busted my ankle or my foot but like i still have to be on my feet so you just take some ibuprofen and just roll with it so. miracle drug i always i was like this how is this stuff like how like you just buy this stuff as i get older i feel like an old man but i'm like i see hot and ibuprofen is just like my best friends now mm -hmm. i googled the other day uh, how is it safe to take it all the time apparently it is not it will start doing like shit to your liver and your kidneys and like i don't take it every day but it's like the last time i took it i'd been sore for days and i felt so good i'm like what if i'm just like punishing myself for no reason i can take this every day uh you definitely shouldn't take it every day yeah, I read the I read the warning labels on anything else, like on that stuff where you're like, oh, okay, no drinking today. Okay, so that's good to know. Like any any if you take, it's either my treat is either ibuprofen or a beer. Okay, good to know. Uh, so you you worked as that. So uh, how long did you work at the Red Cross fully? Just for that one summer, I think. Okay. Grant for that one year, and then so I actually um, I got a scholarship to go to boarding school, um, but it was it was when I was home the summers between my uh, ninth grade and, and sophomore year. So then I went back to school, and I, I think it did. I think they they had the grant carry on through the rest of the year, but I was actually living like an hour and a half away. So nice. And then what would be your next pay job or job thing ro role that you would consider a job that you would do? Um, I think the summer between my junior oh no it would be the summer between my senior year and going off to my freshman year of college i worked answering the phones at pepsi where my mom worked because her uh the lady who normally answered the phones her husband had a heart attack and so she was staying home to kind of like nurse him back to health and take like some uh family leave can you give a, a a kind of a summary of what you would like if I was calling Pepsi right now if I was like calling on my rotary phone hi I'm I'm uh, like I'm, I'm waiting to, on the phone what would you say at the when you would call Pepsi well I call them all the time to talk to my mom because she's bad about picking up her cell phone I can do an impression of the lady that works there now because it's it, it's fucking horrible. like she's like hello hey, Paula <laughs> so they live in Selma Alabama she's always like hold on because <laughs> <laughs> so as, as alabama is like coke started in atlanta so did pepsi start in alabama uh i actually have no idea where pepsi started but like she just uh, works at a very small like distrib distribution center for pepsi but they cover a lot of like lower alabama that's pretty rural and pe I mean, people love coke and pepsi down there um, yeah but Pepsi, like they, they, I feel like they give a lot of money to like smaller communities. Like they spawn, you'll see a lot of like um, scoreboards for like, you know, high schools for their football team and stuff that's been sponsored by Pepsi. I think they're, pr they're pretty good about like. I always felt, yeah. yeah, I always felt like Pepsi products was a mark. This is how I can tell. Like, so if you went to like um, McDonald's, they'd always have Coke products. But if you went to a small business restaurant and they had a, they had Pepsi products, you're like, okay, I'm gonna tip a lot because this business just opened. I feel like no one's first choice is Pepsi. Everyone's like, hey, well, what can we afford? We need soda. People need to eat soda, drink soda when they eat our food. And they're like, well, Coke's too expensive. So Pepsi's our next choice. It was the cheaper alternative, just as good in some people's opinion. I don't wanna start a podcast argument about which one's better. Do you have a preference, Coke or Pepsi? Yeah, my mom would kill me, but I like I like Diet Coke, um, and so she she <laughs> this is one of the few rules she has for me when I go back to Alabama. She's like, just don't buy Diet Coke like in our county. She's like, because like that's our competitor. And I'm like, <laughs> but <laughs> I just like Diet Dr Pepper and Diet Pepsi. It has this weird aftertaste, except for the fountain ones. Like, I'm, did you know that in diet drinks they use a different sweetener in the um, can and the fountain and in the uh, 
plastic bottle because they have different like stability factors for each. I do, I do think we should all recognize the chemistry that goes into the sodas because people always say, and you're from the South, I, I'm, I'm from Texas. People always say soda fountains always taste better than like maybe yeah. bottled. Yeah. Yeah. So the sweet, yeah. So like the bubbles and the syrup are separate and then they're mixing. And so it's actually, it's, it's fresher, like the carbonation is fresher. Yeah, because I, I drink soda water all the time in my little, I, I like my little bubbles when I when I do my podcast because it helps, in my head, it helps my throat. I don't know what it is, but yeah. Yeah, yep, I had, well, I just finished mine, but yeah, I had mine. My <laughs> nice. <laughs> so you, were, you worked there for a little bit and then how, how, the, how was the pay at Pepsi? Pretty good? I mean, it was just like a summer gig when I was like 17 and I don't, I want to say it was like 575 an hour, but I just worked there from like eight in the morning to noon. Um, and then I was like free for the afternoon to go like swimming and do what, whatever, you know? And so it's not like I was paying rent or anything. <laughs> but you still got to work with your mom. Was that, was there any, any weird like conflict or anything? Was it embarrassing to work with your mom? No, you know what is actually like some of the weirdest stuff that would happen is people would call up and like I would answer the phone and they would start yelling at me like because something happened with like their driver or something. And I was like, I mean, just like these insane people will call and be like, well, I'm switching to Coke because your driver missed my route and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, sir, I'm like, I'm 17 years old. I don't even know where you're calling from, who you are, like. There was some guy that called up and cussed me out. And I remember one of the managers called him back and was like, are you, sir, are you aware that I was a 17 year old girl that you called a cunt like that sort of thing? Oh my goodness. <laughs> this guy offered to take me out to dinner. And I was like, I'm not going out to dinner with you. I was like, what the? Fuck? It's just bubble water. Like let's like. I understand people got so wound up about like, I don't understand. Like I still don't understand what happened. Either like a driver missed like refilling their machine or. It's it's a big thing because like I said, my parents worked in the restaurant business. So I remember, I remember growing up in Texas. I remember it was a big deal to have Dr Pepper in your in your uh, soda fountain, and we couldn't afford because they were they were they owned a Mexican restaurant and they could do only do what they afford. And we had Mr Pib, and I almost now kind of prefer Mr Pib to Dr Pepper, even though Dr Pepper is probably the better product. Mr Pib is just what my taste buds are used to. I don't know. Yeah. So Dr Pepper. And 7-Up actually are both like separate companies and it's just who is like the main distributor in that area or, or who pays to have them. So like you could have, uh, so like Dark Pepper isn't a Pepsi product, but I'm, I think Mr. Pibb is a Coke product, unless they're a separate one. Yeah, it's, it's just, I, who knew that this podcast episode was going to be about Coke talk all of a sudden? Like, yeah, welcome, so. welcome back. Welcome back to Soda Chat. My name is David Moscow. I'm here with Caroline Smith. Uh, <laughs> We're on the line, Seth. Go ahead. You had you had a trouble with keeping your soda not going from going not going flat. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but <laughs> uh, mom reads a magazine called Beverage World. It looks like, <laughs> like I'd rather read The Watchtower by Jehovah's Witness. It looks like the most boring magazine. In the As someone that grew up in the South in Alabama, did you have any job that you wanted to do that you were like, oh, if I ever get a chance? I want to work that, like any specifically country or Alabama job. Well, you know, I don't know. Did you ever watch that show Designing Women that was like supposed to be set in Atlanta and the, the lady starring in it, the actress's name was Dixie Carter. I remember, wasn't Delta Burke on yeah, Designing? Delta Burke was one of the main characters and they owned a design firm. So for the longest time, I wanted to be an interior decorator because it just looks like so much fun where you just got to like, mess with like curtains and like fabric samples and like that was like my dream for a while was to be an interior decorator and then I wanted to be an Egyptologist so I like that flew out the window. Whoa I never even this is how this is how over the head my thing was like uh I never even put together designing women that they were interior decorators I was just like is this some kind of coming to age story what if, I like Car Caroline in the city made sense uh <laughs> sex in the city made sense like okay a person in the city, sex in the city, the Golden Girls made sense. I never put together designing women at, at all. Yeah. I don't know, uh, I on after something else I was watching, so I've seen like every episode. <laughs> uh, so you you wanted to get you get you went to college. You went to, from boarding school. You worked at Pepsi. Then you wanted to maybe be an 
Egyptologist, is that the right word? When I was like 12. Yeah. yeah. But so what, what was your focus going into college? Because college is a big, uh, or, or the, your end of boarding school. What was, what was your focus that you wanted to do? What was your future plan for yourself? Well, so like I actually had started um, like developing, developing my own black and white film when I was like 12 or 13. And so they had like a dark room and stuff at the high school. So I continued on with photography there and I started entering some contests and I won a couple of contests like on the local level um, in like Birmingham and other places in Alabama. And I was published a lot and then I entered like a big um, competition, not a big one. Cause it was just like in Birmingham, but it was at this gallery and like, I, I beat everybody else out and I was still like a teenager. And like the grand prize was like, bought, they buy your print from you. It hangs like in their permanent collection. And so after that I was like, well, maybe I should go to school for this. Um, you know, not, I mean, gosh, like digital photography wasn't even like around yet or anything. This was like 1990. Seven, I think that happened. So in 98, I did go um, to art school. I went to the Savannah College of Art and Design and I majored in photography. Yeah, I, I remember I wanted to work the, as someone that got into photography around high school. I was obsessed with like the idea of being like a Walter Mitty and working for like Time or Life oh, yeah. Magazine. Okay. And then uh, I thought Kodak would be a cool company to work for or Polaroid. I thought like, what a dream job like, what do I, like, oh, do I get to design cameras? I thought that'd be a really cool job. Do you ever think about doing something like that? Well, not really, like, on the, so I've never been into, like, the super, like, technical stuff with cameras. Like, people ask me all the time, like, what camera should I buy? Like, what, and, like, I mean, I did a lot of research before I bought the camera that I have now, and I love all the things that it does and how far we've come um, with technology in the last um, 20 years since I graduated from college. Um, but the thing is, like, I, I was always into, like, the printing aspect, mm -hmm. which is like, now I do all digital, but, like, I pretty much learned fine art photography, and then, like, I mean, I learned on, like, the very first Photoshop my senior year of college, then I pretty much had to teach myself digital, like, I've taken classes here and there, I worked for the nonprofit Darkroom Here in New Space for a while as a volunteer, and so, like, they let us sit in on classes for free or at, like, a greatly reduced rate depending on how popular the class. So I, I, I took a lot of like digital and Photoshop classes uh, through them. But like, I mean, when I graduated in 2002, like uh, a digital camera was still like $5,000. It was like five megs, which is like, you know, your cell phone has more <laughs> than that. It was like, people really thought it wasn't going to go anywhere. It was really funny, but then it ended up putting all these like old timers who were just like, nope, I'm only doing film like out of business. I remember, I can remember biking around and seeing people just like entire dark rooms on the side of the road for a oh, while. Wow, people just were tired. They just couldn't do it, so. Uh, in the South, did you have a company called Eckerd's? No. So I think that might just be in Texas or maybe the South. <laughs> it was a drugstore, but they did a photography connected to it so like you would like you would go get your prescriptions but also they'd go to the dark room yes okay we did have one of those i don't remember if we had one in selma i want to say maybe we had one in savannah i've at least seen them it just sounded like it just sounds like a company that would be exclusively in the south like oh i gotta go to the eckerd's i gotta get me some vix and i gotta pick up my photos from my my son's 14th birthday party you know like that kind of thing I got stopped by the Piggly Wiggly on the way home. I, I, I been in Piggly Wigglies and I remember there was a lot of fun. I always wanted, that was one of my, I wanted to be a stock boy or a gross green grocer at a Piggly Wiggly just to have it on my resume. I don't know why. I know the name's so, I mean, I, I still laugh every time I go back to Alabama and see, oh, I'm like, there's the Piggly Wiggly. Right. I, you, you were talking about photography. I remember how, how much of an adult I felt learning darkroom photography. Like I remember I started, the first time I ever did it, I was probably like 16, 17. And I, I took those small canisters. I did stuff for high school and college. I was on my yearbook for both. And uh, so we had, the, we had the little black and white cause it was cheaper than color. And then we'd have to do it completely in the dark and then pop it off, take the film out, put it in this kind of spooly kind of like that and then put chemicals in it does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, that's exactly what I had to do. And it was always really hard to get the film started on the canister. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I mean, and some of them, some of them were easier than others. I want to say like the metal ones were easier than the plastic, but it, it might have been like vice versa. But if you didn't roll it on there completely 
round, you would get bubbles in your film and they wouldn't, the picture wouldn't develop. I, it, it was kind of like someone said like, here are your boots. You have no shoelaces in your boots. Put your laces in your boots in the complete dark. Yep. But then I remember, okay, yeah. I remember what I really loved was once you did the chemical, you did the chemical bath and let that happen, put the chemicals in, and then you would get the the actual machine that looked like a gigantic microscope. And then you would, you would put it over and it would like project the picture like backward, is that right, backwards? And then yeah. you would, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you would like kind of click it. I don't know, I can't remember the process fully, but you would click it and then you would save it and it would expose this photo paper. And then you would do the finishing solution. I go, what an amazing thing I'm learning for free in college and high school. I know, like I really missed doing that. Um, I think the last time I ever printed a black and white picture was, oh God, probably like 10 years ago, which is so crazy. But um, yeah, so like right before I went to grad school, I was still um, working at New Space Photo, which unfortunately is shut down now. And I don't think there's any other public uh, dark rooms in Portland. I've heard there's still a dark room at Portland Community College. I don't know if that's true or not, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really weird to think like I became like I got a degree and became an expert in this like fine art process, but I haven't done it in 10 years and it's so it's so odd. I find like I'm a big fan of your photography. I, I follow your headshots every time they come out. I always love when people say photo photos by Caroline Smith. What do you think is the most gratifying thing about being a photographer? Um, well, since I mostly do portraits. Um, there's so many people that I have photographed who a do not like having their picture taken or they've never been able to see themselves like in a photo the way they see themselves in their mind. And I feel like I've worked really hard to help people like be seen in their photos. Like, I mean, people look at them and sometimes like they've never had a good photo of them taken or um, I'll tell you about a new project I've been working on. I just recently have decided that if anyone who's trans can have free photos for me. So I've done two sessions and, um, you know, it's like the first time they've had photos wearing some, some of like their new, like some, one of them had just gotten like top surgery. It was the first time she had had any like nude photos uh, since that had happened. I think she said it was the only time she'd ever had nude photos. Um, and then I just did another one a few weeks ago and we went out and had like a whole fashion shoot and it was so much fun, like having, you know, her look at the pictures and be like, you know, this is how like she feels inside and she's seeing herself as she wants to be seen, um, in a photo. That's such, I find that to be, that's what a wonderful encapsulation, encapsulation of what that means. Like it really is a beautiful thing when you think about it to try to make someone appreciate like I would take track photos in high school and like having people go, wow, I didn't know you caught, could catch a picture of me going over the bar or me doing a high jump. And you're like, it feels so good to like capture someone's little moment in time, wherever they are in their life and just kind of share that with them. Like you're kind of like co-op, you're, 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 you're in this cooperative process of like giving them a part, back a part of their life that maybe, because as we age, we age every day, every hour, every minute you capture this beautiful little moment of wherever they are in their life and you get to give that to them. And I think that's wonderful. Thank you, yeah. I think especially too, now that there's so many just crappy pictures because of like phones. Like, I mean, I'm sure you've had this, I've had this where people take pictures of me when I'm on stage and they're sitting down and it makes you look a lot bigger <laughs> than you are. And then they post them to Facebook and tag you in them. And then you're just like, what the hell? Like that is, you know, and it's like, I you don't want to be rude, but. Yeah, there's those certain angles you were like, oh, look, I'm a Macy's Day parade float. This is great. Exactly. And it's not, it's like, and I'm like, then it makes me feel bad because I'm like, am I fat phobic? And it's not that. I mean, I was fat when I was younger, but it's like, you want to look the way you look. Mm -hmm. you know, not, I don't know. So like the phones are really bad because they're flat. And then um, I think, I mean, I've talked to other women about this too. Like it's been really hard on some of us, like our self-esteem having to see these like phone pictures that aren't necessarily reflective of reality and how you really look. So when you get your pictures done by a professional, I feel like you can go back to being like, all right, that's the person I see in the mirror. This is like who I am in my mind's eye. How much, how much empathy have you gained being a photographer? How much do you think that's 
added to your personality like that and connecting with people and, and realizing that some people don't like the way they, their smile looks or they carry themselves or their posture. And you, cause you took high, you take high school photos and that's what I remember for me. That was a big, from, from grade school all the way to graduation, such a pressure induced time to get those right. And I was in the time where it wasn't digital. It was like you order them and then they, that you either have fucked up photos or you don't. Yeah, or your parents can pay extra to get like the braces digitally, or your parents are like, I'm sorry, but I'm not paying, you know. Yeah. So, so like, they're like, sorry, David, you have zits on your nose. I'm not going to pay to fix those. Right. Yeah. It's like, that's what your nose looks like. Um, well, so the, the, the graduation photos, um, it, it happened so fast. So, like, we have three different positions. It's either like right when you get your diploma, or it's right before we kind of do like a, a headshot. And lots of times it's behind like the Oregon flags behind you um, or like a high school or college banner. And then right afterwards when you get your diploma and you're in your cap and gown, like, and it goes so fast. It's like, boom, take a picture, next kid, boom, take a picture. So if they blink, I try to take a second one really quick, but sometimes we don't. So in some ways it's really great because they don't have that time to think about it. And then usually like they have the most beautiful, most natural smiles because they're, this is like one of the greatest days of their life. They're getting their diploma. So I don't have to like work too hard to make them smile or anything, but I try to make sure they're like standing where they don't look crazy or, you know. It is funny to think about that You're capturing a generation that have grown up with a tiny camera in their pocket and you're capturing them at a moment that they're not self, they're not doing duck face or not doing gut out their chin or they're not doing any pose other than just enjoying and experiencing that time and how important that is that that's just an interesting and gratifying moment can you picture a moment in in all the time that you've done photography that really sticks out either a mentor that taught you something or a day of photography that really kind of changed and made your made your life feel very good for what you do um i mean i have like one like really like depressing example that sticks out um it's kind of like a, a debbie downer but i mean so like i'll, I'll give you this one and then i'll give you another one okay you edit this one out so during the last recession one of the jobs i had is i had to take pictures of newborn babies at the hospital and sometimes they don't always make it so one of the things we did and we could decline if we wanted to was um we would take pictures of what we call bereavement photos and I only had to do one, but I had to take pictures of a baby that had passed away. And it was like, it was very surreal, but it felt like I was doing something like very, very important for the parent. I mean, like she was just like in shock and I don't know what, I don't know what happened. It was a full term, term pregnancy. Um, it was a very big baby. So I don't know if that had something to do with it or what, but so I had to take pictures of this poor little baby and um, the nurses are like, why don't you just like pose them and do all this stuff? And I'm like, I no, I'm, you know, so they, they had him, they just put his hands where they were like folded, but I was like, I'm not going to, I'm not doing like a fashion shoe with like this, de this dead baby or whatever. But that was really like, I remember when the nurses came to check on me afterwards, cause she was like, it just looks like all the color drained out of your face. And I was just like, I mean, it's just so sad seeing all that, like, you know, this, all the hopes that this family just have to go to waste like that. And you know, I don't know, and I have, I don't even, I don't even know, that, well, I think I had a former, I saw their name, but I don't even, like, I don't know if the family ever had another baby, or if they had kids at home, or, like, what, I just remember being sad thinking about them having to go home, and, like, take down their nursery, and stuff. Absolutely, but you know what, I think, I think you did a good thing, I think that's an important, I mean, I have, I lost a friend this year, and I, I've lost my grandmother, I've lost some other people in my life, and every photo, good or bad, even like a side angle, a th what, what people would call a throwaway shot. Mm -hmm. All of that is so important because I don't know if it's just because I'm getting older too. Our memory kind of distorts things. Our brain kind of distorts the way we remember thing. And to see actually like, oh, I wasn't wearing a purple shirt. I was wearing a green shirt or, oh my God, that baby, like the features, you, that mother probably remembered as many features of the baby as it could, but she's going to have that forever because of you. And I think that's such a great, memory that you're giving to that and i'm sorry that was hard for you but i think that's that that's kind of the the kind of the sad and good thing about being a photographer you're time capsuling this moment for this person and it's on the bad side but it's still an important thing because life isn't 
always good. It's super important for uh, parents who lose a child to, pro to process it. So it moved me so much. I actually looked into volunteering for a foundation called As I Lay Me Down to Sleep. And all they do is take pictures of bereavement photos uh, for parents who just lost uh, their newborn uh, baby. Um, but then, <laughs> okay, so, but then you had to pay to vol. I was like, who pays? to volunteer to take pictures of dead babies. I was like, that's where I draw the line. It's like, I did want to volunteer for them, but I'm like, I'm not paying to take pictures of dead babies, you guys. Like, come on. Yeah, but I, like I said, it, it's still, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Cause you want to help out, but you know, you don't want to. <laughs> uh. Who, it, it just seems so weird to me. It's like, why are you, and it wasn't cheap either. It was like a hundred dollars a year. It's like, why am I going to pay a hundred dollars a year to go, because it, it sounded like you would get a call and get out of bed in the middle of the night and go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I can understand doing it for free. I was totally, you know, going to volunteer. Yeah. yeah, but it's a part of it. It's, a, it's another part of the job. Like uh, pe people that take the crime scene photos, people that have to take photos at funerals or for autopsies or, or for medical insurance. If you're like, if you have like a very bad injury, there's a whole side of photography that we still need that like is not the fun part. It's not the sunshine. It's not the vacation. It's not the weddings. It's not, it's not the graduations and it's still essential. So it is a hard job. Yeah. But are they paying to take pictures of the, like, is the I don't know. <laughs> you pay to take pictures of the I, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't know, but I've never even heard about bereavement photos until you brought that. I, I, I'm so curious. I'm going to have to look that up after we get off this, uh, this interview, but I'll have to look into that. Well, it, if you want to go back, there's a really long tradition of it called memento mori. And so like a lot of times, you know, families would have like a lot of kids and there wasn't, you know, as much like intervention during childbirth. So a lot of times like they lose a child or, you know, not usually not all your kids made it to adulthood. But so, um, yeah, the Victorian era, there's tons of pictures of people um, with um, children that, that didn't make it. Um, like, and that, you know, that was like the only memory they had. Okay. Do you do you feel like it impacted the way you you process your own day to day? Like, do you appreciate life a little bit more? Do you like enjoy every? Not to sound too much like a, a, a inspiration, motivational Monday meme or anything like that, but does it did it help you at any point in your I, life? No, I mean, especially like back then, like during the recession, I'm getting paid nine dollars an hour to take pictures of newborn babies and like um so that was like our fallback back rate it was supposed to be on a commission but like people are taking getting pictures of their children and they don't most of them are also you know losing their jobs and they're just like struggling but i did like there was a lot of things about it that gave me hope like um actually especially a lot of like um the latin families that came in like they would all pull money to just get like whatever the mom wanted and so yeah. a lot of times like they would have me work with them because I speak like a little bit of Spanish. And so like, and the other photographers are like, well, I can't understand them or whatever. But so I would go in and like, we had different little things you could order. A lot of it was just the pictures or like mostly people just got birth announcements. But I remember we had plates. You could get a picture of your baby on the plate and a lot of people bought those. Well, it's kind of funny thinking of eating off of a, I mean, it's probably hung on the wall. They probably weren't eating off of it, but there was a plate being particularly popular uh with latin families. <laughs> it, it is very funny to be to think of like oh cereal bowls like and then you just like oh look my baby like that'd be <laughs> that's an interesting thing but that that's what another thing you got to appreciate about america that everything everything can be a job and everything can make you money it's just that gray area of like should we but i guess it's fine the people want their plates like <laughs> it, it's supply and demand and if, who are you to take away someone's demand for it you know so let's, we, we haven't gotten into any of this. We, we, we've been, I've been having so much fun learning about all the previous jobs. How did you get into comedy and why was that? So, and then like, talk about how you were able to monetize, like, cause you've done shows, you've done open mics. How were you able to maybe make that into something that as an artist you could benefit from just like because of COVID now that helps you because you, you can prove that you were an artist. And I think maybe, maybe, maybe discuss about how up and coming artists can kind of help themselves because if something like this happens again, or I don't know, it just it seems like you had it all put together. It took you a long time, it took you six months to figure it out, but you got it. And if you didn't, you'd be kind of, you know, 
Yeah, like sidebar, when I was talking earlier about what I did with my unemployment money when I got the huge lump sum, I actually put a down payment on, well, first I paid off all of my credit card debt and that sent my credit through the roof. So I was able to get um, a car with a small down payment with a 0% APR because my credit was so good because I was able to pay it off with the unemployment money. So now I have a 2019 Jetta. My other car was like leaking oil and just on its last legs. And so that was like the most positive thing <laughs> that's happened out of this. Um, Congratulations on that. Thank you. It's, it has heated seats. It's like a whole new world out there. You don't have to use an aux cord. It's just Bluetooth. <laughs> uh, I, can't, I can't wait for you to get back on the open mic scene and the comedy scene and everyone ask you for rides. <laughs> I, oh my god right i know i got so tired of that like i finally was like if you live in the same like neighborhood not even the same neighborhood i'm like if you live in the same quadrant as me i will take you home but beyond that i'm like i'm not yeah although last few years i did make like 50 dollars giving people rides because it was so expensive to take an uber yeah i, I think I, I remember i remember doing stuff like that i think my friend steve magnuson who we we both know yeah. uh he would, I, I got, it was like during the, there was a big ice storm during Portland. I think it was like 2017, 2018, big ice storm, snow and ice everywhere. I think everything shut down and I was drinking and I didn't know what was happening. And I was at a bar and hanging out with some other friends. And then I'm like, I'll give you money if you pick me up. And he's like, okay. And we just like, he just came, pick me up. Yeah. And I'm, I'm willing to help my friends help me around if I can pay them a little money, but also like I was in a, I couldn't drive home. It was like, you couldn't drive more than a mile in the ice. So it was nice to have friends everywhere in the city that would let me Airbnb for a, <laughs> a couple hours in their house because I got weirdly buzzed in, you you know, an area of Portland that I wasn't familiar with. So. <laughs> I mean, they overserve in Portland. I mean, like God bless them. Yeah. Like, everybody's like a, a drink and a half or like a double, which is, you know, I mean, there's, there's no, I mean, I always think I, when I, when I was thinking about like my difference between living in Texas and living in Oregon, I was like, there's a lot of reasons weed is legal and mushrooms are now legal. And cause there's no sun and there's sun here in Texas. And I'm like, it helps a lot. It helps seeing the sun. I know it's the winter here is really hard on me, but uh, you know, you get used to it. When I first moved here, I would go to the tanning bed and stuff. Um, and that, that helps a lot. But I mean, this year there's not even that options. I'm just yeah. trying to get out as much as I can during the day, but I don't have a job, so at least I'm not like stuck. This is the palest I've been, and I live in a place with suns because I've been inside my house all day. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we got off track a little bit, but that's okay because that's that's what this is. Um, that's what this is. Do you remember when, like I said, we were talking about your open mic and how? Because it is very hard to think about monetizing comedy at the beginning. But how, because you had a show, don't you, you have multiple shows, you've had storytelling shows, you took fo like photos at shows, you've had a successful open mic. How, do, how, do, how does one kind of like begin to make, and you don't have to get into specifics, obviously this is just a podcast and I don't want you, but like what, what do you think is the best advice for up and coming comedians that want to kind of build a framework to make a little bit of money or to even think about some money in some kind of art, whether it's performing or or adding on, like adding, doing photos, which I always find for me what, here in Austin, I'm like, if anyone needs photos, I'll give me a little bit of money and I'll take photos at your show and I'll make them look nice. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, definitely like people gave me money to take photos at their show. I mean, I've taken pictures of you mm -hmm. a bunch of shows and that wasn't always my favorite thing to do because you can't use the flash most of the time. And so sometimes like uh, if the lighting, if there wasn't like a good spotlight or anything like that, the photos would look kind of you know, I, I do the best I could, but it's like, you can't just take photos like in the dark. Um, but so that was one thing. Um, I've heard other people say merch. It's like a big thing. I know. So I ran um, my open mic. I got into it through Kelly Irwin. Like she basically just brokered a deal with a bar that she liked to go to that had a history of letting other people do comedy there. Um, and they had a monthly show there, but they were interested in, in, in trying out uh, a weekly open mic just to see how it went. But like she and I were really good about promoting stuff on social media and we would do like photo shoot, like fun photo shoots. And we tried to like kind of brand ourselves a little bit. Um, but yeah, before this all shut down, we were talking about doing merchandise. Like our, our show is called Screwed and uh, Kelly came up with that name. And I'm like, 
how much fun would it be if we had like i don't know if we sold like panties that said you've been screwed on them or <laughs> just like just corny stuff like that or yeah. like you know i was really into us like being women so i'm like or we could have like tampon cases that say screwed on them or just just anything to brand yourself and to sell merchandise just like make it clever make it cute make it fun i think one thing about our, our open mic i always heard that stood out is that we try to be nice to people and we just try to be encouraging and uh, especially to like newer like female comedians and stuff like that just be like you know you can come here you're not gonna have like people do gross shit to you yeah. or if they if someone yeah. has gross shit to you we will kick them out like you can feel safe here i think i think that and like i said i've been to your show wonderful show by the way thank you so much for doing that in portland it's always nice to have a uh, a good spot for creativity and also just to feel like nothing bad's gonna happen i don't want to say you know safe space whatever everyone has that buzzword in their head about it but just a nice environment why can't we just say nice environment to do comedy and tell jokes but the thing about merch is very interesting it's less because i used to think it's a little cheesy but it's less that people less selling out and more that people want to be nice and support what you do but mm -hmm. they don't just want to hand you money right i think that's exactly and you have to be okay with that like if you're a comedian you sell cds shirts stickers you do podcasts you can have like a patreon on a podcast or or and it's just way for people to appreciate your art and there's nothing wrong i feel like there's nothing like this is a free podcast i don't ask anything from anybody but if this was i would like have a paywall and if they like the podcast i'll be like if you want, that's all I said. If you like the podcast, and you like the stories. I feel like that's, I think you you both were getting very good at, I don't know. It just seemed like it was just very smart the way you were running your show. Like I didn't even know that you were going to have merch, but I always like, I have no, I have no problems when people do merch at their show. It doesn't yeah. bother me. It was just something we talked about, but so like the way that we did monetize it and like, this is completely a deal that Kelly brokered with the uh, owner of the bar there is that we got a percentage of the drink sales. And um, so we, I remember there some other people who ran open mics, like being like kind of upset with like their venues, finding out like, you know, kind of the deal that we had because there's a lot of bars that were just like not giving them anything or they'd be like, here's two free drinks or whatever to like basically run this free service for us for two hours that bring in customers and there's other people whose names i won't mention and, and bars i won't mention who basically were like oh we're not going to give you any money and then they tried to get them to come back and run a show when they realized how much revenue that the open mic brought in yeah i mean and and i think also in comedy i uh knowing your worth is very important starting out well, so like, yeah, Kelly, like she, she, um, she chose the Firkin Tavern like very intentionally because like by like the proximity between, um, the lamp, which started at like 10 o'clock or 1030 at night. And then also, um, helium that had them like that started at 730. So like people who didn't get on the helium list, because you know, that was like a cure is curated, but also kind of like a lottery, um, they could come to our mic then after our mic, they could go to the lamp. So like in in, the, in terms of like location of time and place, it was like the perfect day and time to have an open mic. And that way we could kind of accommodate everybody. Yeah. It was an open mic. It was three or four hours long. Which is I know. Crazy. And I, I appreciate, like I said, I always appreciated all the times that you put me up. I think me and Adam came in one time when I was getting ready to leave and you put me up graciously. So thank you so much. And thank you, by the way, to every open mic host who's ever hosted open mic. You guys don't get enough credit. It's a hard job. Yep. You know what I don't miss is people giving me all their little stinky colds and, you know, just, oh God, I just, I haven't had, like, like, knock on wood, I haven't had a cold since, like, last March because I'm not constantly breathing in people's, like, grossness on microphones. I think it's going to be great. I think we're going to have to have, like, more sanitary mic stuff. Like, we're going to have to wipe things down more, and I'm all for it. I don't want to smell a mic anymore past um, COVID times. No, I don't either. I mean, if we ever did the open mic again, I would just have my own mic the entire time. I yeah. Think I shake hands with people. Uh, I mean, last month we were doing like the elbow bump, but. I can't wait to figure out the post COVID greeting and all that stuff. So uh, this has been, I, I've been really wa wonderful. We're getting ready to wind down. Is there anything that like any job that uh, of your history that we haven't discussed that you'd like to touch on that was like really important to your life? 
because I kind of like wrote some stuff down. Um, yeah, of course. I'm sorry we got on a tangent. We were like, it was just so much fun getting to know. Like I said, I'm gonna go so so many things I'm gonna Google about photography and about Pepsi now that I just enjoyed our time so much. It's so funny because I didn't even think about talking about any of those jobs that I had when I was a teenager. Um, but yeah, I did. I did want to talk about um, just like briefly when I was a bartender at this place in Alabama called Doc's Seafood Shack Two which was a seafood buffet in a mini mall that was on a swamp. Um, and I got, <laughs> got hired there without any bartending experience. Although I did, I had worked as a cocktail waitress um, at a different bar in Georgia uh, called Bernie's Raw Bar. Um, and we had oysters there. And then at this place, um, Doc's Seafood Shack, they were looking for a bartender that also knew about oysters. So I did, I did know about that. And I did know how to make like a basic drink but um i ended up working there because my friend i asked my friend if she could help me find a job at the beach for the summer and she called her boss and the boss is like we need, we need a woman bartender who looks really good in shorts and is like young and hot and can like keep the customers there talking and she's like say no more fam which is like let me send my friend i was like 22 but i was like i was so honest with the guy that was hiring ron i was like look i was like i can make like basic drinks you know from being a cocktail waitress but i can't make anything fancy he's like that's not a problem he's like most people just order like jack and coke or a bud light he's like anything you don't know how to make the other bartender can tell you how to do it like you can look it up he's like we just want someone hot <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> i do like how you said like keep them talking i i bartended too that definitely is a skill that you have to like like, you know what? That drink keeps going down as the night progress. If you can get them talking, they need to wet their whistle and keep talking to the bartender. And like, what? That that's a very good, I didn't even think about it. I didn't put two and two together on that one. Yeah, just being like friendly and, you know, hospitable. And uh, so, I, you know, it was kind of a culture shock when I moved here because I thought some of the bartenders are real fucking rude here. <laughs> like one time, I don't know why, I just got a wild hair at my ass and I wanted a cosmopolitan and like, yeah, I know sex in the city hadn't been on the air for like eight fucking years or whatever. But this guy was like, <sighs> like scoffed at me when I ordered it. And there was like no one in his bar. And I was like, um, excuse the fuck out of you. I was like, I'll walk the fuck right out of here. I was like, if you think you're too fucking good to make me. And then he just like shut the fuck up and made it. But I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you want my money or not, motherfucker? There's like no one in here. Oh man. Uh, did you, what, what was your favorite night of being a bartender at Doc Seafood? Did you, did you, uh, have a memory that sticks out very yeah. early? Uh, so um, <laughs> my my immediate uh, manager <laughs> was oh my gosh she was amazing like he he was basically an like a really functional alcoholic and he would <laughs> always call me about an hour before he got to work and be like he's like be like Caroline do you have my drink ready and his drink was like an entire like you know those like gallons of like sweet tea they sell down at the south i know people in other places probably haven't seen but you know exactly what i'm talking yeah. about so it would be half of one of those of sweet tea and then the other half would be vodka and i mixed it so that he could drink while he was working and nobody would realize that he was just drinking a, like an ice pick that drink's called an ice pick the whole time so he would get <laughs> this is so terrible and i will say this restaurant does not exist anymore so <laughs> i'm not like fucking them over uh, he would get really drunk, and when customers would piss him off, he would hide behind me and stick his dick in their drink. I shit you the fuck not. And then there's so okay. So then one night after work, um, everybody was having like their shift drink, and this one girl was like, "Oh, you didn't stir this." And I realized this girl liked it when she he stuck his dick in her drink, and I was like, "That is like some of the most amazing ho shit I've ever heard." So like she people saw this happen. Yeah. yeah. And like, no, he didn't pee in their drink or anything. But I was like, are you, I mean, like, it's just so fucking weird. So then I started calling him Swizzle Stick. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very appropriate nickname, by the way. By the way, also, what an informative little bit of a story. Ice pick, because I knew screwdrivers and orange and vodka, but I had no idea that a, that a sweet tea and a vodka is called an ice pick. It is, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. And also, only in the South, can you go to a bar called Doc Seafood where where there's already where where you're like, hey, there's not a dick in my drink. I don't want to drink it. <laughs> I remember I was like that. Wow. Because I just assumed nobody else knew about it. When she's like, she's like, you didn't stir this. Like, like she could taste the difference between 
a rum and coke with dick and a rum and coke without dick <laughs> like i don't want to i don't want to invoke the pepsi challenge because your mom still works there but you know <laughs> yeah. that's the penis challenge on that one that's so weird it's and so how weird it was one of the weirdest places i've ever worked and some of the weirdest fucking people i've ever met worked there and i, I loved it i loved how fucking weird it was how long did you end up working there so I worked there for six months. Like I worked there from March, 2003 to September, 2003 to save up money to move to Portland. Nice. And uh, do you ever remember a particularly night that was either good or bad? And then we'll wind it down from there. Like a night that you like, this is what I would relive. If you could relive one day at Doc Seafood or <laughs> I would never want to relive. Either way, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in either. either uh, to be or. honest, like all the days kind of blended in together i mean there was always just kind of like funny shit happening there um uh so like okay so in like i don't know if this happens in texas but in beach towns in alabama there's more jobs that are open in the summer than there is the population of the town yeah that happens and, yeah so to fill in the deficits they actually bring in people from the prison to work there like low level offenders so i mean this is the first time i'd ever really like interacted with people that were like incarcerated and it's really sad too like seeing how like marijuana is legal now in oregon and stuff i like if any of them lived in oregon now i don't think any of them would have been it, it's legal in like 32 states in some capacity so it's crazy to think like it it makes me hopefully when it gets legalized hopefully i would think it's it sucks that the current administration that's coming in in january doesn't want to legalize it nationwide because i feel like that's just eh you know, you got to be happy with what you can have right now. You're like, okay, great. Silver lining on that. It's not that other thing, you know? Yeah. So I mean, they were always pretty funny. Um, did you have a, did you have a regular that was your favorite at docs that would um, come in? There was um, this hairdresser that used to come in. He would drink, he would uh, always drink gray goose on the rocks and would get um, a dozen oysters. And he always like tipped too much. He always came in at happy hour and he's always like buying other people drinks. And he did my hair one time and fuck, he fucked it up so bad. I will never get my hair. <laughs> what, how did it look? What was it? I mean, I will, I will say in his defense, it is hard to cut hair down there just because of the humidity. It's like, it could look amazing when you leave it and it's gonna look like shit. It just like, I mean, it was just always like fucked up ass, like Farrah Fawcett <laughs> wings that like flipped. <laughs> Oh God. Very, very Xanadu roller rink kind of vibe. Exactly, but it's like it would do that on its own without any hairspray in it. Like how on earth can you fuck up someone's head like that anyway? <laughs> Well, that's, that's amazing. Uh, I, I think, like I said, I've been, I've been doing this podcast now for a long time and now we've been talking for about an, over an hour and we've just run out of time, but I just think we should maybe think about more jobs in the future. We could definitely have a part two. Cause like I've talked to people and I'm like, there's just so much you could talk about, about jobs that don't encapsulate someone's full life in just 60 minutes. And now we've been going a little over, we're about uh, a minute and uh, an hour and six minutes in, and it's just been such a fun day. Thank you so much for doing this with me. I mean, it's weird to think I've been working for 25 years. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and that a recession would, knock on wood, help you out enough to get a new car. So that's great. I know, right? I finally like get something. <laughs> uh, where can people find uh, all your stuff, your photography, your comedy, everything about you? Let people know. Um, if you want to follow my Instagram for my photography, I would love that. It's at starry eyed Carolina. Um, on Instagram. Uh, I don't really have like too much comedy stuff up right now, but I mean, maybe in a year you can come do my open mic at the Firkin Tavern. There you go. There, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'll, I will definitely make sure to tag uh, your photography Instagram on that stuff like that. And thank you so much for doing it. This has been so much fun. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. And uh, we'll talk to you very soon. I'll hopefully, I'll hopefully be in Oregon in uh, August of 2021 if everything works out. So. Oh, I hope so hopefully, I mean, something's got to give by then, right? <laughs> and we'll, 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 next time we'll see each other, we'll share a Pepsi. Okay. Oh, well, mine's going to be a Diet Pepsi. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.